We're back. It's fourth and forever. You know the drill. Unfortunately, looking back on this past weekend, I mean, people are dropping like flies this year. It has been tough to watch because there's been some notable injuries across the league. I mean, let's just start with the 49ers. They lost their quarterback, Garoppolo. They lose their running back, Mostert. They lose Bosa, who's, you know, the heartbeat of that defense. Richard Sherman's already on IR. I mean, they're they're depleted, and they were one of my picks to potentially make the playoffs. So this is really throwing a wrench in the works here for San Francisco. Can they hold on? Can they sustain you know, a little success here with Mullins in at quarterback. That remains to be seen. I, I know he's played well before. They just finished with the Jets, and they're having a rough go at it this year. Even with their depleted roster, they handled the Jets and didn't let them score. So that tells you where the Jets are, but it also tells you where San Francisco's at. Maybe their experience can help propel them to a couple wins and just keep the ship steady for a little bit until these guys come back and get healthy and they make a late surge. But you see Saquon Barkley, we saw Sterling Shepard go down for the Giants. I mean, those are two huge weapons for Daniel Jones, who has already had, you know, a, a tough start to the year. They're 0-2. But both quarterbacks in New York, I mean, golly, these guys need a little help, folks. This is tough. This is tough sledding for these guys. So I've been in their shoes, and it's not fun when your roster looks like what theirs look like right now. Cunningham looked like he got nicked up a little bit from the Bears. That's going to be a huge loss for Trubisky, who we're going to have on the show shortly. And then again in Denver, you know, losing two of your top players, but most notably your quarterback, Drew Locke, who had a superb end to last season, is expected to take that next step and assume the leadership role on this team. And now he goes down with a rotator cuff injury. That's going to be a couple weeks, and I believe it's on his throwing shoulder. So that's going to be constant maintenance, constant rehab. I went through that as well. Those are no fun because you're constantly thinking about it. Certain certain throws will kind of get away from you at times, and there's nothing you can really do other than try and maintain it as best you can and then potentially have surgery at the end of the year. But Anthony Barr goes down for the Vikings. Their heartbeat on defense. Now Kendricks is going to have his hands full, getting those guys ready to play. They've already lost Everson Griffin to the Cowboys. So, man, I mean, bring in the energy, bring in the juice, especially without fans in the stands. When you lose one of your motivational guys on offense or defense or the heartbeat of that side of the ball, it's really difficult because you don't have the fan interaction right now. It's BYOJ. Bring your own juice. Bring your own energy this year. And... These guys really have their hands full. They got their work cut out for them, and uh, it's going to be an interesting go these next few weeks, seeing seeing what happens, who gets healthy the fastest, or really who can maintain their health uh, and longevity through this season, and that might be the team that ends up on top at the end of the year. And then you ask yourself why. And I think the immediate reason and and initial response would be the lack of an off season. And you know, my personal take on it is without preseason, as much as everybody hates the preseason because it just feels weird, you need those games in my opinion because in preseason week 1, generally your starters will play a series or two. So that could be anywhere from, you know, 3 to maybe 10 plays tops. So you get that little action, you ramp up, you feel the night before, you get the jitters as you run on the field, boom, you, you get hit maybe one time as a quarterback, you complete a couple of passes, you miss a couple of passes, whatever, but you kind of get into the flow of things. You start to feel what it's like to get back into the game because all you've done is scrimmage all off season. And as much as that helps, you got to be on the field. You got to, you got to experience the live action reps to get ready for the season. So you go through week one and that's really the drill. Maybe three plays to 10 plays. Then the next week, you could potentially play, you know, three to four series, a whole quarter, maybe into the second quarter. So you're you're feeling a little more of the game. You're starting to get into a real flow, into a rhythm of the game before you come out, usually before halftime. And then that third week, you're playing essentially half a game, potentially into the third quarter with some teams. But you you get a real flow for what an entire game is about to feel like, and you stop just short uh, you give yourself a little time because then that last preseason game is on a Thursday. You hammer out the bottom part of your roster. Your starters don't play. They're generally in tennis shoes. They do a workout before the game like they're going to play. And then they sit and watch and generally help coach up some young guys, maybe uh, reaffirm some relationships or establish some relationships with guys that are potentially going to bottom out the roster. And then you go into week one. And that's kind of your crescendo, your ramp up before you get to the regular season. And without that, 
I just feel like these guys have missed out on so many twists and turns and pulls and pushes uh, that your body goes through and starts to warm up for. And now they're just going zero to 100 like that. It's just give me everything you got right out of the blocks. And, you know, the guys who are staying healthy, you know, some of this stuff could be freak accident. Some of this stuff could be a testament to guys taking care of themselves and what access they had to workout equipment, facilities during quarantine. When everything gets shut down, if you're out in the middle of nowhere on a farm with a bunch of hay bales, well, you don't have as many advantages as maybe somebody who's right next to a high school football field who can run around, do some drills, throw a ball back and forth with someone that they're quarantined with right? You, you just have different, a different set of circumstances, but at the end of the day, you're judged uh, the same way, right? In this meritocracy that is the NFL. It's just, what have you done for me lately? How well have you played in your last game? And uh, some of these guys, you know, are, are feeling the effects of no off season. So it's been unfortunate, you know, the start of this season, but moving forward, I'm so excited about our guest, a good friend of mine, a former teammate of mine, Mitchell Trubisky. Gosh, this guy who's on our show today, I'm not sure if we were destined to be friends because I want to give a little backstory. Mitchell Trubisky, spoiler alert, is our guest this week. Thank you, Mitch, for taking the time. But I was in Chicago his rookie year. Mike Glennon was the starter. I was supposed to be the backup. And for two weeks, that was the case <laughs> until the draft and we draft Mitchell Trubisky. In full disclosure, Mitchell coming in the building kind of rocked my world because now I didn't dress for games and I became this third string quarterback. And so I was a little pissed at Mitch being around. And then I got to meet him. Then I got to know him. Then I got to see his work ethic. I met his family and I fall in love with the kid. I'm one of his biggest supporters, despite you know the challenges it presented in my personal career. So Mitch, can you talk about when you first got drafted to the Bears and maybe some first impressions and some of those first meetings in the quarterback room, because they were a little awkward, at least I, from my perspective, they were. So explain, you know, your entrance to Chicago and what that was like. Yeah, I think it was uh, more awkward for you guys than it was for me. I mean, for me, it was pretty exciting. I was like, oh, dude, just got drafted. Like, the NFL is sick. Right. I got Mike Glennon and Sanchez in my QB room. Like, I'm going to learn so much from these guys. And then I go in there and you're like, uh, we don't really want this young kid to be here, but <laughs> I guess we got to teach him some stuff along the way. But I really thought our quarterback room was a lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed it with you and Mike. I learned a lot throughout the season. Wasn't obviously the best season statistic statistically or uh, wins and losses per se, but uh, you got you got to grow. And uh, I think we developed some really cool relationships in that quarterback room and definitely came away with some good stories and, and life lessons as well. So, yeah, I was just a young kid coming into the league and I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. I got some I got some real vets in my QB room and <laughs> we really had some vets uh, across the team and some interesting uh, yeah. like characters and personalities my rookie year. And obviously the roster changes over in the NFL so quickly and a lot of those guys aren't here anymore. But uh, it was definitely an eye-opening experience, but I think coming in, I was just so excited to be with you guys, and <laughs> it wasn't that way right away. But we, 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 I think that's where most like really good relationships start out. Sometimes, like you, you're not always expecting it, or you come in with an idea, and then it's not exactly what you expect. Because uh, going into it, you and Mike weren't exactly what what I expected either, and 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 that was for even better in our relationship. So it, it just turned out even better than I thought. So it, it was pretty cool. Yeah, your first impression of me. Do you remember our first encounter and what was that like or something from that year that you just like, man, that's, when I think of Mark, that's what it is. When I think of you, I'm less like, you know, you know how to work a room. Like when you're a room, when you're in a room, everyone, everyone knows that Sanchez is in a room. You're talking to everybody, greeting everybody. Watching you is really how I learned to like, learn other people's names like when you're walking to the room like say hi to the chefs say hi, say hi to the people working in the facility like you're just nice to everybody and like that per personality is really infectious like people want want to be around you and they're like oh dude sanchez is, is here he's in, in such a great mood and then the other thing i always remember is just you getting like uber eats and like crazy amazing meals to the quarterback room while we're <laughs> like eating eating like cereal or cafeteria food and you're just eating like the craziest burgers getting like shipped into our quarterback room we're like dude mark where the heck is our food man like you just ordered food for yourself 
But, uh, yeah, Sanchez would eat whatever he wants uh. in our quarterback room. It was crazy. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, talk about that's, that's awesome. That's really funny. Yeah. I don't skimp on meals, dude. I won't, I won't relent when it comes to food. I, I just love eating maybe too much, but Dave Ragone, I would have said the best quarterback to ever come out of Louisville until this guy, Lamar Jackson, maybe <laughs> jumped on the scene. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely. He might be blowing, he might be blowing rags out of the water, but talk about Dave Ragone because it's not often that a quarterback coach survives when a head coach gets fired and a new coach comes in and a new regime is kind of in the building, especially on that side of the ball, right? You get a new offensive coach. They usually want to bring in their own coordinators and their own quarterback coaches and position coaches. So. Talk about Dave Ragone. He was one of my favorite quarterback coaches that I've ever had. One of my favorite stories about you and Rags is after um, when when the, the virtual reality stuff first really started and on Fridays, how that became a part of the routine that you'd go back and watch all your reps from practice. And then he'd go over it with me as well, even though I was going to be wearing tennis shoes on Sunday, which was ridiculous. <laughs> but we'd go through all the reps anyway yeah. to keep me involved and to keep me engaged so I can help you as much as I could during the game so I could remember all the plays and stuff we were doing during the week because you don't get reps. I'm doing scout team and you're playing. So talk about Rags and what he's meant to you as a coach and as a friend. Yeah. Um... Gosh, Coach Ragone is going to love the fact that you shot him on his show. Like, as soon as he hears this, he's going to text you right away and be like, Mark, that's why you're one of the favorite quarterbacks ever coached, just because just cause the shout outs and him getting. <laughs> oh, but yeah. he, you know, you know, Coach Ragone, he's just got that personality that, like, he truly, he truly cares about you as, like, a person and a player. And you, you feel that right away. He's always wondering what's going on. He always asks you how your family is. And he cares about the person before the player first. And I think other coaches have seen that. His players definitely feel that. And then when the staff changes over, I think that's what helps what, what helped him stick around. And on top of that, his knowledge of the game and how he's willing to help. You know the hours Coach Ragon works. I mean, he, he watches Ooh. film like – like it, it literally is his job but like he's staying up like all hours of the night waking up way too way too dang early to cracking down film and getting in there but the, it's that relentless work ethic that that really pays off to to help teams win and um and preparing the quarterback and he does a great job of that but i just think uh how much he cares for his players and and the guys and yeah. he's just somebody you you can always talk to no matter what situation it is whether it's football whether it's something you just want to get off your chest he, he's always there for you and he's just like a he's just like a fun guy to talk to and and and, and to bust his balls a little bit and there's always <laughs> yeah. that he, he's a pretty good trash talker like going back and forth and uh he loves the goalpost game and he's actually one of the oh. better like he, he's i'm gonna give him credit and you probably will too but he he's so good at that it's the goalpost and it game. really like, pissed hitting me off. the crossbar like from any yard line it's like I don't know if he can make any other throw, but he can make that throw. And that game is, <laughs> that game is still going on to this day. He'll, he'll be like, all right, here we go, 30-yard line. Here we go, cross right. bar. And he's so, slowly okay. moving it up and up because his arm strength is diminishing. Yeah, he's getting – But he's he's absolutely hilarious that, with that. So he's just an amazing person to be around, and uh, he's been a fantastic – uh, quarterback coach and uh, and really just someone I consider uh, closer to family more than a coach now. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And it, to frame that story for some of the people watching and listening, it's throwing the ball and hitting the crossbar, right? The, the horizontal bar of the uprights. It's like a thing that quarterbacks do. There's like a satisfaction that you can feel when you hear that ding of the ball hit it. Like it's a it's a thing among quarterbacks and doing it, you know, if you throw it from your knee or you throw it from the 50 yard line or you throw it from the 10 yard line, it, there's strategy that goes into it. There's a trajectory throw. There's, you know, a line drive kind of throw and you nailed it. I mean, Rags loves this game because he wants to hold that over your head because you're still a player. He has everything to gain and we have everything to lose when we play that game because we were current players at the time. So if he beats us, we look even worse. You know, it's almost like the Division I powerhouse playing a Division I AA team. They're not going to get anything if they win. They're expected to win. But if that other team wins, it's like they're king of the world. And so he won't let you forget it. Oh, my God. I remember we were doing it in the snow. One of my last few days as a Bear and the last few days of that season, your rookie year. And we're out there. We must have thrown 30 to 40 balls at this damn goalpost. And he finally hits it. Although I contest... I think I hit it before, but I couldn't really tell. 
and it would have been like the slightest like ding instead of like a loud one and so he didn't count it because he's a cheater classic so, classic right and i situation. hate him <laughs> so, <laughs> no but he's the best i want to talk about um this last well your first two games man i couldn't tell you how excited i was for you and i texted rags right away on the throw in Detroit, I know they had a chance to win it at the end, but that's, you know, the defense has to handle their business. You guys got to handle yours. You go out on the field after having, you know, a rough start. It's it's not an ideal start. You throw this dime, bro, right by the front pylon. And I'm just like on the plane coming back from Bristol after being uh, doing the ABC show for college. And I literally scream on the plane. Yes. <laughs> you know, I scream so loud. <laughs> the people around me are just like jesus like what just happened and i was just so elated for you what were you feeling in that moment just talk me through that play yeah i was feeling the same thing obviously the first three quarters the first week of the season didn't go the way we planned it but we battled back and um you can attest to this it's some of the, sometimes those are the most fun games that you you have when things don't go your way but at one point it does, it turns over and then you get momentum back and then you just feel like you're in a place where it's unconscious and you're not thinking, you're just going out there and playing and slinging it around. And that's what it was that fourth quarter in Detroit and that last ball, uh, I was just throwing it with confidence. I just, I, I was really comfortable with the play and the matchup we had and Anthony ran a great route and I just felt like I put it in a spot where he could go make a play. And uh, like you said, uh, I appreciate your excitement on the plane because that's exactly what we were feeling too. And especially with no fans in the stands, you, you look around you're like, yes. And then like you're like cheering. Yeah, that was, you can like hear yourself That was cheering. my next you're question. Like, Whoa. <laughs> wait a second <laughs> wait no one else is cheering but uh okay sweet that's, it, it, it was it was super exciting just the the fashion we we battled back and uh got back in the game and it was pretty cool to cap it off with like with a pass like that to anthony and, and it was a big yeah. play and, and it feels good but um as a player you know you're learning and growing and you continue to look at the mistakes earlier on the game and what we could have done better and you try to carry that into the next week and um, and that's what we're trying to do this week as well. And then you guys play your two and O. Obviously, you play uh, the Giants' second game, and this time you guys come out of blocks smoking. You're on fire. The first that first drive to get the scramble touchdown to Montgomery. I mean, you converted a third and long. You converted a second and long with a screen to Tariq Cohen. And then what? Walk me through that first touchdown play because. Something's not right downfield. You make that assessment. Boom, you start to escape the pocket. And then you look at Montgomery for a second. You're like, no, because the backer expands. So you're like, okay, it's on me. I'm going to run. And then what? Yeah, it was uh they had like a they had drop eight, so they had more guys yeah. covering than we had guys in the pass concept. And I just went through my progression. One, two, three. David was actually four, so I'm all the way back. And he's running like his swing route. And I, the backer was kind of like coming up on him. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to throw it. Then I was like, all right, I'm going to just go scramble for it. Go get the first down. Then as coach likes to say, I was the flame mignon. So he came to me. I dumped it over his head. Uh, David caught it. And it was just an amazing after the catch run by him. Uh, and he took off, yeah. cut cut across the whole field and got into the end zone. But it was just those off scheduled plays down in the red zone, getting close to like the red zone fringe, the red zone area. And uh, just trying to make a play with my feet. And I pulled a guy out of coverage, uh, being aggressive, running for the first down. And I just dumped it off. And uh, it's always nice to get it to those playmakers because uh, they, they get crazy run after the catch by David. He did an awesome job just like yeah. weaving through it, people. It was, and it was sick. It, it was it was so – it was one of those like such a surprise ending to that play because it looks like, you know, like you're going on a fast break and you're going to go like slam dunk. Like you're going to go full speed and just dive for this first down. And then at the last second, you see like a really good point guard just like pass it off quickly or or a quick little lob or something. And, I mean, you had them so confused on defense. It was, it was awesome to watch. And then the other thing that's telling about your group, and I want you to speak to this, is – the way they block downfield, when they realized the play was still alive, Mooney, um, you name it, Patterson, these dudes immediately, and, and it's the way they're coached, but some of it is their personality, it feels like. For sure. They're just, oh, shoot, the play's on, let's go. Find a body on a body, and let's spring this guy. 
What's that all about? Why are they like that? Yeah, it's definitely the personality of offense right now. Just unselfishness, just like we don't care about stats. We don't care about who gets the glory. It's about wins and getting to that ultimate goal, which is an opportunity to to play for, play for the whole thing. And I think those are the personalities we have in our team right now. We're just guys are working their tails off. I think it feels off, feeds off from our offensive line. And you know some of the guys on our O-line, just like unselfish guys, always doing the dirty work, yep. blocking their tails off. And I think the receivers, tight ends, and other backs see that and they're like, dude, we need to we need to go the extra length downfield. And they're throwing box blocks for each other. Jimmy Graham, A Rob out there, young guys like Mooney and uh Anthony Miller. Yeah. There's they're like, we gotta get our guys into the end zone and they don't care who gets the credit. They just they just wanna win games. And with that attitude, I think you can accomplish a lot as a group. That was definitely one of yeah. those instances, and I think you saw it later on in the game as well, where guys are just throwing awesome blocks downfield and I think that's where more explosive plays come. So uh, a guy knows like when, when it's their chance to get the ball in open field, that those other 10 guys are going to be working their tails off the block for them too. So it's, so it's definitely a team effort and it's, it's really cool to see. Yeah. Um, and, and I appreciate you taking notice because a, a lot of, a lot of people don't notice that, but I think that's how great teams are built from inside yeah. out and just that un unselfish play without the football. And how about a guy who doesn't get a ton of credit? I mean, those guys up front, Leno, Massey, um, uh, Cody, they're studs. They've been there since your rookie year. But how about Bobby Massey's catch last week? Hey. He had a reception and a conversion on a third down. Fourth down. He caught the ball, looked at the sticks, and falls forward to make sure he got it. That was incredible. Talk about that play and what did he say? Like, oh, yeah. Like, what, what was he like? Because I know Bobby, but you explain it. Yeah, you you know Bobby. It was fourth down, actually, and we're going for it. Oh, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Fourth, fourth down. down. Even even juicier, you know? So you're rolling out. I'm throwing, like, a late, um, like, return route to, to Jimmy Graham. He's, yeah. He's double teamed. It, it was a real tight coverage. They did a great job batting the ball away. It's, like, bouncing up in the air and, like, you're like, oh, gosh, no chance. And just another like tidbit of unselfishness slash like effort. Bobby fell down earlier in the play and is like getting up to like get back and like either block somebody or what. And as soon as he gets up, the ball is in the air, bounces his way. He catches it and has like the thought process to like dive forward for the first down. And it was awesome. But you know, Bobby, I go to him after I was like, bro, was that your first catch? That was sick. He's like, yeah, it was my first catch. <laughs> like, just really nonchalant. <laughs> just like, I was like, bro, you got to be more excited about that. Like, fourth down conversion, yeah. first catch of your career. Like, yeah. But he's just awesome. He came in it, like, like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Like, thanks for noticing. <laughs> like, come on, dude. <laughs> it was, oh, it was so awesome. I so love Bobby. Bob. Yeah, he's been here since, since I've been here. And uh, he's really been just like a, just a solid, solid, like, is one of the core players of our offense, like the, the heart and soul of our yeah. offense, that offensive line up front. Just him, Leno, Whitehair. I got to shout out all the guys, James Daniels and then Jermaine Fetty. Like they did an awesome job. And the coolest thing about that play was I think James Daniels was more excited than Bobby was. He's like, dude, my guy caught a pass. <laughs> he like jumps on him. He's like, let's go. So it was, it was really cool. Tell us about your, uh, that inside fade, dude, you guys end up kicking a field goal. Uh, what did I want to know? What Ragon said about two plays last week? The not the fit, not the second interception. That was tough. I mean, the guy's trying to catch it a 50 50 ball and it kind of lands in the DB's lap, which was crap. And I was pissed. But you throw the deep ball over the middle, like a big in route coming in, and it gets batted up in the air. What did Ragon say? It was just one of those plays where. I got to be on the same page with the receiver and you got to give the DB some credit. They do a good job breaking on the ball, yeah. but it's me half with the accuracy, half, half with the receiver going and attacking the football and preventing that from happening. So it's like, it's a little bit of each and you have those plays throughout a game where it, that was one where the defense made a good play, the ball bounced their way and uh, you kind of just forget about it and move on. But uh, those are good plays to learn from and, and grow from. And I think hopefully yeah. our offense will be better from that moving forward so we can prevent that stuff from happening in the future. But a lot of times that yeah. ball will go straight to the, straight to the ground. It was just unfortunate when right up yeah. in the air to the other team. So no doubt. And those things, I mean, for fans, you know, those things even out, like, sure, that one got picked off, but you also got a ball that got tipped to Bobby Massey for a first down. Like these things, the ebb and flow of the game, you got to be able to handle that. And it sounds like you're really doing that. I remember, you know, in your rookie year when things like that would happen, 
you're like frustrated just like everybody, but it's, you know, you feel like the weight of it. And now just hearing you talk is, is, uh, really impressive. And, and I'm proud of you because it, you know, it shows your growth. It shows you understand these experiences and, and you keep growing and you're only continuing to get better. Um, and I'm so happy the way you guys started it. And I said this on TV, I said, if anybody needed a fast start and a good start, it was Mitch Trubisky because my dog's been getting a lot of criticism after one season, okay? His rookie year, like, let's just go through this now and be reasonable, right? Like, try and eliminate my biases. Of course I'm biased. I love you. You're my buddy. I want you to play well. Of course. Like, I'm going to go to bat for you. But unbiased approach and opinion, you know, your first year wasn't a great year for you to learn because everything's chaotic, up in the air. You don't start right away, then you start, but we're not really, I mean, it was your year to learn a lot about playing football, right? So you're kind of running around throwing. I wouldn't say you were necessarily like a quarterback that year from my perspective. Then your second year, boom, you have the weapons, you have the system, you have it. And now it's in place. And now you got a sweet defense. These guys can ball, they can give you the ball back. And now you're on the offensive. And now you're making these plays that people are like, whoa, this is why we traded up to draft this guy. This is who we wanted. And it's starting to come together. Then last year, it's like everybody forgot about that in one week or two weeks. Like you go through an injury, right? You hurt your shoulder. I remember seeing Chase Daniel play in London or wherever the international game. And then you come back in, you're nursing this injury. I mean, were you that healthy last year? What was the deal? Because you didn't look like you have these past few weeks and that, not that you didn't have the energy and juice, but it just looked like you felt it a little bit. And explain where your head was at last year. Yeah, uh, appreciate having my back, Mark. Uh, that's pretty cool. And I know <laughs> you reached out to me last year while everything was going on. It's of course. like, dude, some things, sometimes you just got to battle through stuff and, and grind through. And last year is one of those years where, uh, it wasn't necessarily going our way. It, at times, we just weren't clicking or didn't have that magic on offense that we did two years ago. And um, pe people people just forget. But it's it's all about what have you done for me lately? And you're only as good as your last game. So we understand that as pros and we move forward. But yeah, last year, it, it was tough. And I think I learned a lot as a player and as a person and just how I was perceived from the outside. And um, I, I learned so much about myself dealing with that injury and all the criticism and uh, my shoulder was hurt when I when I dislocated it I I partially tore um, my labrum and I played with that all season long and uh, I, I played with a shoulder brace which is very uncomfortable and I don't know how it affected my throwing but I definitely wasn't the same player that I was in 18 and um, I don't know if I was I wasn't looking to run more or if defenses were just keying on me running where I, I didn't take off as much as I did in 18 compared to 19. And that's just what it was. But I'm just all of that's in the past now. I mean, I, I had this huge offseason with the competition and everything and it being my contract year. I was just took an and it's just been a crazy year with quarantine and all that. I looked at last year and I was like, all right, I had surgery in January. I was like, this is this is my time to like get healthy, get my mind in a mentally great space where I can just go out there, work out really hard this off season, fix the things I need to fix with my mechanics and studying and all of that, and just give myself the best chance to go out and succeed this season. And, uh, and sometimes just, you know how it is going through hardships and adversity, I think sometimes brings out the best in you. Like it's, you really see who's in your corner. I know that was huge for me and my support system has been everything. Uh, my family, my brothers and sisters, my girlfriend, um, just them having my back and you really know who's in your corner and who you can lean on and who you can trust and who has your best interests going forward. And uh, I learned a lot about that this off season, but it, 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 I don't know where when it clicked for me in this off season, but I was like, I really don't care about anything else. I'm just going to, I'm just going to work as hard as I possibly can. I'm it's it, anything anybody says is just fuel to the fire and I'm just going to attack it. I'm in attack mode. I want to bring this edge every day. My teammates are going to feel me. My coaches are going to feel me and I'm just going to try to help the team win in any, any, any way I can. And a lot of that was, God, that fires me up. Thank you. Let's go. Like, that's so awesome. But yeah, and, care, and those two pictures behind you, that's, that's it, dude. You got to take care of your body. Don't eat like me, whatever you do. Um, but those two pictures behind you, they, 
as soon as you set up the camera as we're getting ready for this interview, the man in the arena is one of my favorite quotes ever. And then you have the stadium right there because that is your arena and you are that man. What does the man in the arena mean to you? It's, I, you could read through the whole quote, but to me, it's just like, it's, it starts out like it's not the critic who counts and and that's exactly right it's it's the critic does not matter in all of this it's the person in the arena giving the effort um putting the blood sweat and tears in um and and the person in the arena we know what victory is like and we know what defeat is but the critics who who talk about it they really don't know what all goes into it or how it feels to go through triumph or defeat but we do and that's and that's what it's all about just and if you know that then anything else really doesn't matter you can go in and and feel good in your own skin that you laid it all on the line you put it all out on the gridiron every single week and um if anybody has anything to say about it it's it it really doesn't matter so i think just reminding myself of that helps me and keeps me mentally focused and um at the end of the day it gives me perspective that it's it's we're blessed to be able to play this game and do what we do and we're the man in the arena we're the one that counts out there i love it uh, mitch you sound so mature and like things are just really clicking for you switching gears and moving forward to this next week it's a hell of a challenge and i know atlanta's 0-2 you guys are 2-0 and you had some tight games they've had some real tight games they have to be, at least in my opinion, they're probably one of the best 0-2 teams in football right now. And, you know, they, they drew the Seahawks first, and the Seahawks are on fire. Everybody's seen that. Then they have this huge lead against the Cowboys, and the Cowboys kind of hang around, hang around, hang around. They get the onside kick, go down and kick a field goal, and now the Cowboys are more or less back. But heading into this week, what's your mindset? We, we have to reset. I mean, us being 2-0 and and then being 0-2 means absolutely nothing. And I think as a leader on this football team, I, I have to make that point. I have to get that point across to everybody on the team. Like, And we know they're a super talented football team. You can look at their roster across the board. They have dudes on offense and defense and special teams that can make plays. And they've been in two very tight games. And you know how, you know how it is in the NFL. Every single week, the it can go either way. And it could look like it's you're going your way the whole entire time and then fourth quarter everything switches uh it happened to them in their last game versus dallas it happened to us in our first game versus detroit and you just have i think being conscious of that going into it will keep us more focused for this week in our preparation we know they're a talented team we're not taking anybody lightly and i mean throw the records out the window we got to come to work this week come be prepared as much as possible we have to work for this game like like it's our first game and like it's our last game. So just mm -hmm. leave everything on the table. Let's go to work. Let's go get a W. And uh, we know we're going to a good football team. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be a really good battle. We're excited about it. And uh, it's we gotta have a huge week of preparation. So I think as a leader on the football team, I gotta make sure my guys are locked in, ready to go, and not looking at the numbers or what everyone else is talking about on the outside because it really doesn't matter. Anybody could be anybody on Sunday, and we got to make sure that we're the most prepared team and uh, and we want it more than they do on Sunday. I love that. And then what, what about this will be your second road game. What's it like traveling so far this season with, you know, COVID restrictions and no fans? Um, how do you think everything's worked out so far? I think our uh, team has done a great job as far as just making adjustments and keeping everything safe, um, being strict on wearing masks and washing hands and hand sanitizer and uh, spacing everything out. So we're socially distanced and we have the Connexons, which I don't know if you're aware, but it's like this little tracker that you have that basically tells you if you're spaced out enough between people and if you're not, then it'll be bred. And there's a lot of precautions in place that are um, just trying to limit um the the exposure i guess but and we're getting tested every day but it's definitely it's definitely a lot different um there's just a lot more logistics that go into it so like the people who are in charge of that they've done an amazing job so far just taking care of us and getting everything organized uh, i think we have twice as many buses um and twice as many seats on, on the airplane because everybody has to be spaced out 
And uh, right. it's just a lot different. And you're wearing a mask the whole time uh, besides that practice. You guys take two planes? Um, I don't think last week we did, but I know that's a, uh, an idea going forward. I think we had enough last week where everybody was spaced out. Um, yeah. But I know we're taking twice as many buses to and from the stadium. And then yeah. our schedules yeah. just switched up I've on Saturday that. to where our meetings aren't at the hotel because there's not enough space at the hotel rooms. We have them at the facility. And then once we get to the hotel, we just get our food and go to sleep and get ready for the game. So it's just a different preparation. Oh, but cool. I think guys have done a great job adjusting and our staff has does an awesome job um, just making those adjustments to where everybody can get everything they need to go out and perform on Sunday. And then what about the no fans? Is that just so, cause on TV, I got to tell you, they <laughs> pump in the crowd noise. So is that just on the broadcast or is that in the stadium? I think that's just on the broadcast. I mean, sometimes they're playing music in between plays and um, yeah, I really can't hear the crowd So it's noise. like a scrimmage. It's like a, it's yeah, like an off season scrimmage. Sometimes it's like a scrimmage. Sometimes it's, so you're so like, weird. like a play will just end and you're like locked in, like completely tunnel vision on the play. But then after it plays over, you're like, whoa, it's really quiet in here. All right, next play. <laughs> And you know, like, and, That's and weird. And more times it's like when you're on the sideline, you're like looking around, you're like, oh, sick play defense. And then you're like, dude, nobody's in the stands. And you just like try not to think about that and just focus on what you, but yeah, the people I've talked to, I've, I've yeah. talked to my brothers and they're like, it seems like it's the same on TV because they're pumping in crowd noise and right. they don't show the, they, they don't show the stands. But when you're out there, it's like, you got to bring your own juice and your own energy because the momentum's different um, with no fans in, in the stands. It's, it's, it's a crazy thing, but Hey, at least we're able to play, you know, it's crazy right now. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and then what about communication wise? Cause now you can hear a lot, right? Even on defense, like, if you got a stack formation of two receivers and you hear the defense, hey, combo, combo, like you usually couldn't hear stuff like that. Right. Has any of that worked out to your advantage or disadvantage if they hear you, you know, if they hear, you know, Bobby Massey telling Cody like, hey, you know, deuce this guy, deuce 50, whatever. I mean, they can like clearly hear some communication on right. both sides of the ball. Has that affected anything? I don't think it's not too much yet. There's been a couple times where like, I've been able to hear the calls like, okay, it's man, it's man. Like, and, or they're like, no, pass this off, pass this off. Or like, Hey, we're in and out this guy. And you can hear it. And yeah. sometimes there's been like probably two or three times where it's like, okay, this is going to help us. Or like, sometimes I'll hear the coverage and, but we'll, we'll be like running the ball um, anyways, and it won't have that much effect, but it's just weird yeah. how you can hear different stuff. But I think just getting used to that and being able to pick up on that and somehow use it to our advantage down the road. I think yeah. it's all part of this, just playing with no noise in, in the stadium and then also being conscious of that. Cause we don't want them to hear our calls as well. And, and just having yeah. a lot of calls and dummy calls. So they're not, uh, picking up on anything, which I think we've done a great job of. And I think as long as we keep up with our tempo and our playing fast, it'll, it'll be hard to catch on to what we're saying or doing. Switching gears a little bit to more personnel stuff, but you guys picked up Jimmy Graham and you guys drafted Cole Komet, two incredible tight ends. What's their relationship like? And um, how has it been throwing to guys like that? Their relationship is like big brother, little brother. And <laughs> Jimmy is the ultimate vet. He's, uh, I don't know if you've been around him at all, but he's, he's awesome. He's the man. He's like, uh, he's very cerebral when it comes to the game. I wasn't expecting that when he came in. He's like, he knows a lot about the tight end position and football and the way he's able to communicate that to others. And he's, he's helped Cole a bunch. He's helped myself a bunch too. Just like the way he sees the game, the offenses he's been a part of. And he brings that energy that's really contagious to practice and the game. I mean, you see him getting fired up. You see him spiking the ball when he, when he scores a touchdown, doing like his airplane celebration. He brings a lot of excitement. Yeah, this guy flies planes. Does he talk it's about nuts. that? Yes, he does. It's like, it's though he's like, he, he talks to like the, he talks about everything that goes into like flying a plane, like his checklist and like the different types of planes he could fly. And it's like, dude, this dude is speaking another language. I'm like, what are you talking about, bro? <laughs> like, but it's, it's crazy what he's able to do. And that's how he has spent his off season since he got in the NFL and him being a pilot is like one of the coolest things. I think only a couple 
guys in the NFL can say that. I, he might be, he probably is the only one, but he's just yeah. so smart. And if in football and in other aspects of life, like him being a pilot, like there's a lot of stuff you got to know to be able to like fly a plane. And, but he's taking that, <laughs> yeah. he's taking that same approach to like his checklists and, and, and flying planes to football. He's like, all right, I got to do this, this, and this in order to be successful. Like, this is what I'm doing on this blocking assignment. This is how I'm doing it on his route. And his attention to detail is crazy. And I think that's what's helped guys like Cole Komet and the rest of the guys in our offense. I think they're taking notice of that. And they're like, all right, if I want to play 13, 14 years in the league, this is how detail oriented I need to be. This is the energy I need to bring to practice on a Wednesday and Thursday. This is what I got to do. And if you just ask him questions, he's always willing to help. And that's what he's been there for Cole. And Cole has just been, he, he's been a sponge. He's trying to absorb every ounce of information that Jimmy can give him, the coaches can give him. And uh, he loves getting reps. We're throwing on the side a bunch and we're going to get these tight ends going. And it's, they're, they're going to, they're, they're a really good du duo. And I think the rest of our tight end room is really good too. Demetrius Harris and JP Holtz. We got a lot of dudes who, who can roll now. JP's and, still there. Yeah. I remember JP. So um, yeah. And they block their tails off. It's like, dude, how how cool are these guys? Not only can they go up and make amazing catches and separate from linebackers and safety, but there's just the unselfishness to and just like the desire to want to go out and just block people and, and punish defenders. It's it's really good for the offense, and I think it it all starts with like a, a really good vet presence with Jimmy. So it's been really cool. Entering the season, there's a quarterback competition. I've been with you. I've been with Nick Foles in Philly. Uh, came in for Nick Foles when he got hurt. Then he got traded. Sam Bradford came in. So we've been in the same quarterback room for a while. What's your relationship like now? Because I know him. He's a great dude. Um, you know, so unassuming, just like nice guy. And, you know, he's got a cannon. He can, he can sling it. He's got great experience. What was it like coming in to an open quarterback competition when, you know, you're essentially the guy and then you know, the coaching staff is like, hey, we're going to, you know, open this thing up. I, I mean, I remember going through that at USC, going through that with the Jets. And a little bit of me is like, whoa, hold up a second. Like, I'm still the guy. Don't, you know, get this thing twisted here. I'm the guy. But yeah, if, if we got to do this, let's do this. And so there's a competitive side. And then, you know, as soon as you're off the field, like whatever the other guy needs, I'm your homie too. I'm your teammate. So how have you navigated that situation and what was your first impression? Like how did coach Nagy even tell you that was going to happen? Yeah. So I just like run one random day in the off season. I was already motivated as it was, but as soon as they like brought someone else in and, and it was Nick, I was like, Oh, this competition is on now. Like it's just mo more fuel to the fire. I'm locked in. I'm just going to keep doing my thing and improve everybody wrong. And then I get a call later that day and it's Nick Foles, like <laughs> just the nicest guy in the world. Like, Dude, like, I know the situation, like, it's going to be competitive, but I'm also here to help you. And he's like, look, I, I want to have a great quarterback room. And you know how it is. That's really important in the NFL, having a tight knit quarterback room, just yeah. guys who can push each other, but also have each other's backs. And that's kind of how it's been like from day one. So it was kind of like, I want to win this thing so bad, but you got to like see the human side of it as well. Be like, yeah, we're all in this together. It's about building really good relationships that last a long time and uh, a cohesive unit that helps this team. And uh, it, it was a good competition and we both were just hoping for a, a fair competition and may the best man win. And um, it, and it was awesome. And then after the, the decision, he's he's had my back all the way, just his experience his experiences, like he, he's had a crazy career and some of the stories he's been able to share with me, crazy. I'm like, I'm like, bro, like, how can you be so like, like chill and mild mannered and so like down to earth, like just being some through some of the things you, you've been through. And he's just been so helpful with me and my mindset, um, just helping our quarterback room, talking to the coaches, sharing his experiences of the offenses he's been in and what he's been able to bring to the table. and. Um, just not only how he's helped me, how he's helped other position groups just see the game differently. Hey, think about doing this on this play. Um, do this with your eyes and footwork over here. This is what I used to do here. Just little like tips like that. And just him being willing to offer that and just says a lot about him as a person after going mm -hmm. through a competition and just wanting to help the guy. And even on the sidelines, he's like, dude, I'm here for you. Anything you need, like, 
I'll be your ears and eyes. Like I'll talk to the guys for you. Like I got your back. Like we're in this together. But you know how it is as competitors as well. Like you, a part of you still wants to, right. like you want to be playing. And we've had those conversations as well. But to be able to put that aside and be teammates first, um, I think is important for this team. And he's been a great uh, contribution in addition to to this offense and his ideas and what he's brought. I think are going to help this offense evolve and, and take the next step hopefully because he's been a part of some um, really good offenses as well and he's had a really good career that speaks volumes about him being willing to offer that information and then of course someone like you in your position you know might have this static mindset or a fixed mindset like i don't even want your help you know like you're the enemy but for you to be open and have a growth mindset and want to you know absorb that information that speaks volumes about you so that that fires me up that Ragon still got a hold on that quarterback room because if he didn't, I'd go in there. I have to whoop some ass, man. I have to come back. Bring my John Gruden voice. Bring <laughs> the Sanchito oh, voice. Give it to us one time. Give it to us one time. <laughs> hey, man. I've been in Las Vegas now for a couple months, man. It's different on the strip now. Quarantine has kicked this town's ass, let me tell you. But we are a fighting bunch, okay? Here at the Las Vegas Raiders. Viva Las Vegas, baby. But listen, man. Mitch, proud of your start, 2-0, but did you see us on Monday Night Football, man? <laughs> did you happen to catch the Raiders on Monday Night Football? Sure to impress. We lit up that scoreboard like a Christmas tree, man. Did you see it? Did you watch the Raiders last night? Yeah, I caught some of the game last night. That's really good, that was... really good impression, man. <laughs> you still got it. You still got still it. Still got it. I still got it. <laughs> Who gave you the name Trubiscuit? Where's that from? True biscuit. Uh, I think growing up, it was kind of like a baseball in this game, a nickname. It started off as just okay. biscuit, like bisky, like here we go biscuit. Like right. I was hitting clean up, like just crushing dingers. So I was like, you got to have like a great okay. baseball name, like biscuit. Or Chill something. out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, like self-proclaimed Babe Ruth over here. Chill I'm out. Kidding, I'm kidding. And then the curveball comes, and you're like, yeah, well, I'll just stick with uh, football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll play football. I love Going it. Up, yeah. uh, then so, your Mr. Ohio, your Mr. Ohio football. How the hell did you end up at North Carolina? Yeah, it was crazy. Just uh, like looking back on it, you just like you just know where you're, you where your journey is like supposed to end up, where you're going. Like looking back, I was like North Carolina, but then I got there and then I went through college. I was like, gosh, I had the best experience ever. Like just the people I met. Um, the friends I made and the experiences I had at North Carolina. It was like, it was my dream school and I didn't even know it. So coming out of Ohio, um, I was like, it's Ohio State or nothing. Like if you're one of the top prospects, you're like, dude, I got to go Ohio State. And you right. want to growing up in Ohio, it's the Buckeye State, right? So they kind of were like soft on the recruiting, like weren't really feeling me. And then I, and this was like before I had my senior year. So before I won Mr. Ohio, my senior year, Cause every, all the quarterbacks were committing and I was like, dang, I wasn't, I wasn't, I'm not ready to commit anywhere yet. I want to go visit these schools, but all the scholarships were getting taken up. Like Ohio state took someone like Michigan state, Penn state, all like the big 10 Northern schools up by in Ohio. Who did they take? Tell me who they took. Uh, Ohio, Ohio state, state they took, took uh, JT Barrett that year and he had an awesome That's college right. career. So Penn state, who'd they take? Hackenberg. Committed on our junior okay. day when we went there. Uh, Michigan State took uh, uh, okay. Damian Terry in our class. And then um, there were a couple others. Michigan? Michigan. Uh, I forgot who went to Michigan. Uh, I wasn't really a big Michigan guy. I didn't really want to go there. But all arrows were kind of like throughout the recruiting process were kind of pointing towards North Carolina. And I took a visit there the spring before going into my senior year. And I got on campus. I was like, dude, this is it. This place is sick. Like Chapel Hill. Oh, that's cool. Carolina blue. Like, dude, you're jealous of the Carolina blue. You love it. So here's the, here's my issue and why I bring it up. I was leading you down this road. Uh, I'm wearing some, you know, jump man shoes here, but Mitch, what really bothered me my rookie year, and maybe I would have bought you food rookie year if we would have got some damn Jordans. Okay. <laughs> You had a Jordan contract in college. You no, are the flagship school of Jumpman, okay? Did you see Michael Jordan on campus? Did you ever say like, hey bro, probably gonna play in the league, might be like a top pick, why don't I just sign with you guys? I don't, it blows my mind. This is one of the mysteries 
of the NFL is how Mitch Trubisky isn't the jump man face of the NFL. Why? <laughs> Bro, <laughs> first of all, I've told you this many a times. The UNC went full Jordan the year after I left. So I, I was kind of bummed about that too. So we didn't, we didn't really have Jordans. Only the basketball team was Jordans when Jordan when I was going there. And then they made the full transition after I left. I signed with Nike. Nike Nike's amazing. But you're a Jordan guy. And I could have got us some Jordans. My bad. I didn't. And now all these other teams are going to Jordan too. I'm just, it's, it's kind of confusing, but I use UNC's Jordan now. I get some North Carolina gear. It's sick with the Jordan on it. And uh, I don't think if I would have told Jordan, like, my freshman year of college when I saw him at the basketball game from 30 rows up at the basketball arena, I was like, dude, I might be a top pick one day. He'll be like, yeah, get out of here, kid. He, <laughs> I don't think I would have believed that either, let alone Michael Jordan. So I, I, I wasn't even close to being – anywhere near him I was I was shouting from the uh from the nosebleeds up there at the only game he was at but besides that um I don't know maybe we could reach out and get get something done and uh yeah it's, it's I mean really, it's, Mitch, it's a really cool brand one of the best quarterbacks you're one of the best quarterbacks if not the best quarterback to come out of that school I'm a size 14 so feel free I'll send you my address any other stories that you remember from when we were together? Dude, what I do remember and what I tell everyone about, anytime we have a team stretch, I think of you because I'm like, yo, back in the day, rookie year, when I was stretching with Sanchez, he would make these crazy noises during stretch and it would, and none of the guys were having that. And we just look over and be like, what the hell was that? And Sanchez would be over in the corner just like stretching, making weird noises and the head strength coach would be like, oh, God, Sanchez doing it again. What is going on? I would make those like uh, uncomfortable, you know, bedroom noises that, you know, adults apparently make one day when I'm adult, an adult, I'll know. Uh, but I would make them really loud and then just have a straight face right after <laughs> just to see people's reaction. And they were like, what? <laughs> I think it just made people really uncomfortable. I really had fun doing that. I'll never forget <laughs> That's it, terrible. for sure. Mitchell Trubisky, thanks again for your time. Awesome guest. Great to catch up with you. Appreciate you taking the time. Good luck against Atlanta. Give everybody your social handles. Where do we find you on Instagram with that blue check? And Trubisky10. All right. Anything on Twitter, Snapchat, what else? I know no, you young good. kids. Just Instagram and Twitter. You can follow me if you want. If not, I probably won't see it anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> fair enough well we're at fourth and forever youtube.com slash fourth and forever as well so thanks again mitch we'll catch up with you soon appreciate it mark nice catching up with you man like share subscribe uh at mark underscore sanchez at fourth and forever instagram twitter all that you know where to go thanks again for having us and we'll see you soon